Hey everyone, welcome back. Thanks for joining me and welcome to the channel if this is your first time. Today we've got one for the B8 crowd. We're going to be doing a full front and rear brake job featuring the StopTech slotted rotors, street pads, and then I'm going to be replacing pretty much all the hardware because we're all good boys and girls who replace our stretch bolts when we know that they need to be torqued to yield, right? And then I'm also going to be doing the rear brakes the most pro way. I'm going to be using the Rostec VCDS to operate the rear parking brake motor, that's the electronic parking brake, and do the brake pad adaptations. A little bit of a garage queen, daily driver battle wagon. By looking through the calipers, I could tell that the rears were done. They actually look in pretty good condition, but the fronts have very little pad left. I'd say maybe two, three millimeters. So anyways, I called Audi and usually I just want to see, out of curiosity, what they would charge to do the job for me. And I think I got quoted around the 1600 Canadian dollar neighborhood. So of course, being a car guy, we know that uh, you can buy a lot of good parts for 1600 bucks. So I jumped on to ECS tuning and I got the axle pack. Uh, it's actually pretty good value. You always get all the rotors and the pads all in one. And I think I paid in the neighborhood of 600 American dollars to get that. So I'm pretty happy. If you're like me, you kind of love hearing those dealer prices because it makes it really easy justification to buy your own stuff and maybe do a couple upgrades and buy some extra things while you're on the site, right? Anyways, it's nothing crazy of an upgrade. These are still OEM sizes, so the rear is the 300 by 12 millimeter, and then the front is the 320 by 30 millimeter. I don't have an old comparison picture on my phone of the summer wheels, but I've always been disappointed with how much dust that the OE pads create, and I noticed that the street pads here specifically advertise that they have low dust quality, so I'm really interested and hopeful that that'll be the case. Small point of contention, but for the record, ECS made me whole on this, which is why I have three front rotor boxes. It's not uncommon to see this type of damage. It's not my first time seeing the top of a rotor box blown out. But in this case, it was my first time seeing a hat of one rotor smash through the back of the other rotor that was shipped on top of it. See that crack right there? I actually had to get this swapped out for another one because I couldn't run this. Compared to the work that I've done to try to get the brakes to feel a little better on the B7, I've actually never had a complaint with how they feel on the B8. So after we're done this hardware change here, even if it increases just a little bit, maybe some extra bite, I'll still be really happy. Word of caution, just in case you don't know, brake fluid is very damaging to paint, so be careful. If you are bleeding your brakes as part of your job today, just look out for that. I'm not gonna be doing that, although I might be taking a bit of fluid out of the reservoir here just to account for the change in pad width. Time to get to the install then. Car's gonna go up, wheels off, and I've already got the trickle charger on to make sure the battery's at 100% and stays there for by the time we get to the rear brakes. Can you see the little lettering in there? Jer, ma, ni. It's kinda cool. The fronts are a little bit more simple, so we'll start there. Now before we go unbolting anything, let's just remove the pad wear sensor. So just take a set of pliers and rotate this black piece right here. It'll turn and pop out of the bottom of the metal bracket and then you can disconnect it from the sensor which it's connected to just on the left. Then head over and pop open the bleed screw cap, like so, and then you can fish the wire out from there. Thankfully this is only on the driver's side, but for those of you living in warmer climates, be glad that you don't have to deal with rust like that. Anyways, next up we gotta pop off the retaining clips on the caliper, put on your safety goggles first, then put in the screwdriver and pry outwards like that. There's only two small bolts that hold the caliper to the carrier, but before we remove those, do you have something ready to hang the caliper with onto the top of the suspension? When you're ready, you can take out the two 13 millimeter bolts. There's just one on the bottom of the caliper here, and then another one where the brake line comes in, right there. Meanwhile, I'm doing the left and right sides in tandem, but check this out. This is the first practical use of the new wall lighting in the garage. All right. I hope you ate your Wheaties this morning because this is the tough part. What we need to do is remove the two big bolts that hold the carrier onto the back of the spindle so we can get at the rotor coming up. These are the two big 21 millimeter bolts right there and right there. And I've had them soaking in penetrating oil for about the last day here since I started because they're held in currently with about 145 foot pounds of torque. So I've got the wheel at full lock here in order to give me a little bit of access around the side of the car. Get your good tools, your best socket and breaker bar, and get in here and give it a good pull. Liquid wrench for the win. That was super easy. Last, we just have to remove the one T30 set screw that holds the rotor onto the hub. 
Chances are pretty good now that your rotor is stuck to the hub, and since you're probably replacing your rotor, you don't need to worry about damaging it, so go grab your favorite hammer to give it a wallop to break it loose. I'm just using my plastic dead blow. Welcome to the top of my head for this last bit of disassembly. You can see from the missing dust shield that I took it off. It was really grimy and I wanted to do my best to clean up the spindle and the hub face, which I've done, and to try to make things look a little bit better once the brake package goes on. The last bit that we're gonna do together here is I have new dust boots, these guys right here, as part of the pad package, but you need to remove the caliper guide pins to do that. So I've already done the other side and I just wanted to show you there's like no grease left in here at all. Just goes to show that uh, this stuff does evaporate and, and wears out eventually. So you do need to do this once in a while. And you can tell just by pushing on the pins, you know, it's pretty stiff. Shouldn't be quite this hard. So I'll do the easy one with you because uh, the uh, brake line isn't in the way. So all you really need to do is pull down and then you can reveal one edge of the pin just by pushing up the boot. Kind of gives you something better to grip. And then you can take a pick and slide it in the top. And obviously you don't need to worry about damaging anything. Pull it above. And then pull it right out the bottom, just like that. For the boot, just compress it a little bit and you can slide it through the ear of the caliper. Just like that. There's one final task before the install, and we need to compress the front caliper pistons back into the caliper so that it'll accept our new pads. Now, I do have a set of retraction tools from Schwaben, but they're useless in this case because the design of the caliper doesn't allow for the tool to be passed through it. So we have to do it the janky but tried and true way, which is take your old pad because you don't care if it gets damaged, put it back into the piston, and then compress it. You can either take a C-clamp and squeeze or take a pry bar and pass it through there. And your goal is to just apply even pressure, that's why the pad's there, into the piston and send it back into the caliper. But you need somewhere for that pressure to go. So take off the cap of your brake fluid reservoir and do something to make sure it doesn't overflow. Either extract some of it with a syringe or an extraction tool, put some paper towel there, You'll be the boss of how much fluid comes out of here and how fast. Just make sure it's accounted for. When the piston is fully retracted, this is what it should look like. Real quick, look at the gluey stuff that's on the inner side of the caliper for the outer pad. Hold that thought for a second. And here's the corresponding brake pad. The metal shim that's usually on the outside of all brake pads, it was actually stuck where I showed you on the outside of that caliper. And that was the case on both sides of the car. I don't know if this is factory glue and this is all intentional, or perhaps since the pad was getting so thin, maybe there was a lot of heat coming through the remaining bit of the pad and heating up the outer surface, and this was just an adverse reaction to whatever was the coating on the shim, but wow, never seen that before. Finally, reinstallation time. So if you took off the dust shield, that goes back on at seven foot pounds. A nice coating of anti-seize on the hub so that there's less rotor whacking the next brake job. Clean both sides of the new rotors really well with some brake cleaner. Set screw back in. I just do it sort of firm to the touch. Ooh, shiny. So if it isn't obvious about which side of the car to put which rotor on, in this case, StopTech makes it really easy. Sticker, instructions. But I also made a video recently about which side of the car to put your rotor on, depending on internal vein design, and then talking about outer surface designs of slots, dimples, and cross drills. Check it out up here if you have any questions about what to do. Extra brake lube on the back of the pads before they go back into the calipers. Extra, extra lube inside of the guide pin boots. Then a little squirt of WD-40 in the caliper ear really helps the boot slide through. And then you can send the pins in through the boot after. Back on goes the carrier and we are replacing our two 21 millimeter big boy bolts. These are stretch bolts and they get torqued down to 196 Newton meters or 145 foot pounds. Then install the new pads into the caliper, at which point you can remount the caliper onto the rotor and the carrier. And then we can install our last little 13 millimeter bolts that come from the factory with some blue Loctite on it. By the way, put blue Loctite on just all of this stuff. And we can torque these down to 30 Newton meters or 22 foot pounds. Man, you know what I really need in this garage? A media blaster. 
I spent some time on that rusty bracket I showed you earlier and I uh, just got the surface rust off and gave it a fresh couple of coats of paint. Right here is where the pad sensor gets mounted to and the brake lines go into here as well. Just wanted to avoid that problem in the future. So very much unlike this style of pad retaining clip, the B8 has a way more user-friendly style that still has quite a bit of tension in it, but you can actually install it by hand, which I will do. No finicky screwdriver or hammer mania here. You can literally just push it against the caliper and gently slide. it into place. And onto the rears. Now before we take anything apart, we need to address the parking brake. The EPB, as it's referred, electronic parking brake, there's a motor on both sides of the car that sits in this black plastic housing attached to the back of the caliper. We need to disengage the motor in there so that we can operate on the new brake pads. Now, I have the Rostec VCDS system, but I'm fully aware that there are other non-software related ways to do this job. And I will address those quote unquote alternatives later in the video, but because I have the software to do this, I'm going to do it that way. It's technically the most correct and the way it should be done at a shop or at the dealer. This is the CAN USB connector that I'm using from Rostec. We'll be using VCDS version 20.12. And just keep in mind that this is an 09 event, two liter engine with the 8K code. Rostec is very clear that there are some prerequisites before you do this job. So, number one, are the parking brakes fully assembled still? Yes, we have not touched anything. Second one, is the car properly hooked up to a battery charger? Yes it is, it's humming away. Car key is in with auxiliary power on, all systems that might be drawing power like the lights or the radio are off, and the hex can is plugged into the computer, ready to go. The first step is just to double check to make sure that the parking brake is still working in the first place. So cycle it on and back off. And we're ready to open the brake. So let's go into selecting the control modules and we will select 53 parking brake. When this loads up, it'll confirm a few things for you. First of all, here is the code that I was referencing earlier and what you'll need to be looking for in the Rostec wiki. 8K for this A4 here, and protocol CAN. It doesn't really matter uh, in this case. You might be searching for UDS if you have a different vehicle, but we'll jump into basic settings, and it's going to ask if we've done our prerequisites, which we have. Now, here's where the first discrepancy is. What I'm showing you on screen is the instructions for the A4, the 8K, and you'll see that it's prompting you to pick a pad lining change. That is not an option here. But as it turns out, the instructions for the A5, the 8T, are the right instructions. So back on screen here, you can do one of two things. You can go directly to group number seven and hit go. So that, as you heard, just opened up the rear parking brakes. Or you could have pre-selected that from one of these drop-downs right here. If I would have clicked open rear parking brake, the exact same process would have just happened. Now just to be safe, I'm not going to touch anything for 30 seconds. And then when that time is done, I'll close out the module here, shut down the program, and we can start working. You also notice that the parking brake is flashing now, which is totally fine. Also mentioned on the Rostec site. Just an indication that something's up with the parking brake and you shouldn't go for a drive right now. The reason I was so confident using those A5 instructions on the A4 here is because I got help. So the awesome benefit of being a registered Rostec user is that you're entitled to support. And that's exactly what I did. When I was in VCDS and I started to notice discrepancies between what I saw there versus what I was reading on the Rostec wiki page, I reached out and just asked what's up. So big thank you to Andy Smith who answered my email. He gave me a lot of good information, pointed me to the right instructions, but he also gave me some other really important pieces of information. Namely, there are no rear brake pad adaptations to do in this car. You do not need to go into the VCDS or any kind of software after the job is done and tell the computer how thick the new rear brake pads are. The rear brake motors in these vehicles are smart enough to automatically learn what that new thickness is the first time it re-engages. And here's the thing, there's actually other ways to do this job that are cheaper, let's say. 
So the Rostec unit that I'm using here is on the more expensive end of things. It's an older model. It's the hex can. It's got unlimited bins on it. But I think these days I would push you around eight or nine hundred dollars American. So I can't deny that there are cheaper tools like, for example, the OBD 11, where for a couple hundred bucks, you get a tool that sure isn't quite as capable, but has a ton of pre-programmed processes in it that'll let you do stuff like this. But and I'm sure you've noticed this in your own online research. There is a way to do this without using any software. And the information I got from Andy technically does confirm that you're not at massive risk. My words, not his by any means, but that's the way I'm interpreting it. So although I think there's some very cost effective ways to do this the proper way, I will talk about the purely mechanical way. But what people are doing is removing the two bolts that hold the motor onto the back of the caliper. Once you take it off, looking at the back of the caliper, there is a little socket on the back of the piston and you can now rewind it clockwise, now allowing the piston to eventually be retracted into the caliper, allowing you to do the brake job. Okay, wrenching time. So similar to the front brakes, all we want to start with is removing the two 13 millimeter bolts that go through the guides and counter hold that with the nut on the top of the guide pin itself. With the caliper up and out of the way in this nice little nook. By the way, I also took the power out of the parking brake motor and I pulled the brake line out of its bracket on the back of the spindle there. And now we can take out the last two bolts that hold the carrier onto the spindle. These ones aren't as beefy as the ones in the front. It's two 18 millimeters and they're very easy to find. They're just tucked in the back, one right here and then one down here. Yep, much easier than the front. Should have been able to pop out your pad hardware pretty easily. You know what I really like about these brake pad loops? You should also be using fresh pad brackets. Hopefully you got those with the pads that you bought. Now, just one more T30 set screw to take off the rotor. There's not a ton of room back here. You know what it feels like to hit the back of the brake disc with a hammer? That's it, disassembly complete. We can start going on towards the install. I wanna take a moment and just do a little bit of a refresh on the carrier guide pins as well. It's really easy, TRW sells these kits where you get two fresh boots, um, some hardware that goes into the back of the pin, and some lube for the pins themselves. And truly, it's just a matter of yanking out the guide pin, like so. You can see that there's still a good amount of grease on here, but they give you a full fresh pack. So I'm gonna wipe this down and then we'll toss the boot and just reinstall. Back to the car, rotor area prepared, rotor clean, time to remount. And with that, we are ready to reinstall the carrier again. So I've got all my fresh pad hardware in here lubed up and we are going to put in two fresh 18 millimeter bolts. Long one goes in the top, short one goes in the bottom. And these are stretch bolts. So these get torqued down to 100 Newton meters or 74 foot pounds plus 90 degrees of rotation. When it comes time to load in the pads, just mind the lubrication again. On the pads themselves, I like to just put a little bit where the piston is gonna contact the inside pad and then where the caliper is gonna touch the outside pad. Also pay close attention to if you have lubrication for the little ears where the pads are going to slide and whatever style of spring retaining clips that you have. Mine are the ones that have the little spring that bounce back and the ears sit in between the loop and the little spring pad right there to keep the pad off of the disc face. Just make sure there's some lubricant for things to slide around. Now that these brakes are looking very Halloween, we need to do one more thing before we remount the caliper. So remember, that process that we did earlier, all it did was retract the arm inside of the motor. It didn't actually retract the piston itself, so we need to do that. Any old trick will work to push that piston back in. You could have done it at the beginning of the rear brake job too. You could have just pried it against the old pads and disc, but since I actually can use my Schwaben tool set now, I'm gonna do it now. So I've already picked the attachment that I need and I made that decision based on what design was on the piston face. So one, two, three indentations in sort of a Y pattern. There actually isn't one for that, but what I can do is use this single indentation. And all you do, just in case you've never seen one of these before, is put it on top like so. There we go. Now that I've got the tool set up, you can see why I couldn't use this on the front. There wasn't a space in the caliper for all of this to go through. So really all you're doing is using the caliper itself to provide resistance to turn against. So we have the end of the tool fed into the plate that we just put there. 
there's a plate that backs out onto the backside of the caliper and then really you just turn this and you slowly compress and rotate the piston back into the caliper. The rotation part of that is key. There's a lot of pistons in a lot of manufacturers that are only rotate and compress. They don't just compress, so you need a tool to do both at the same time. You would have been able to remount your caliper now, and we're on the home stretch. All we need to do is reinstall some fresh 13 millimeter bolts in the back of the caliper guides, and these go in at 35 newton meters or 26 foot pounds. Mechanically speaking, the job is done. The rears are fully reassembled, and we've got our battery charger hooked up. So let's get back in the car and finish up the software end of things. So very similar process to before. We'll pick our same control module, number 53. Back into the settings. Now at this point, I could do it the group way. I could go to group six this time, which would automatically close the brakes. But just to be wild, let's do it from the predefined settings. So let's go close rear. What you couldn't just see is that the parking brake is no longer flashing, and I'll take that as a good sign. So the parking brake is off, even though the brakes are now closed. And what I want to do is run a function test. So we'll go back in, and once again from the predefined settings, I'm going to do function test. So what you just heard there, that prolonged noise, was actually three cycles. That's what's supposed to happen in the function test. Once again, I'm going to wait 30 seconds, and then I'll close everything out. Now before you congratulate yourself on doing a full brake job, there is still one very important thing we need to do, and that is bedding the brakes. So I think this process is a little subjective, but this is what Centric, aka StopTech, says to do for the bedding procedure. I am absolutely by no means an expert in pad compounds or chemically what's happening during this process. I'm just regurgitating what the instructions are. So what they want you to do are 10 braking cycles. And really all that is is get up to speed. It's either 80 kilometers an hour or maybe about 50 or 60 miles an hour. And then hit the brakes nice and firm, maybe 80 or 90% of the total stopping power and bring yourself down to about 10 miles per hour or about 15, 20 kilometers an hour and then let off. Cruise around for a little bit, try not to stay on the brakes at all, and then do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Back from the cannonball run, everything's feeling good. I think it was probably around the fifth or sixth time that I nailed on the brakes that my stomach started to heave. They're uh, definitely working. They got nice and warm, I could smell them in the cabin, and then they started to fade towards the ninth and tenth time, but being that it's minus seven degrees Celsius right now, it wasn't too hard to have a cool down run and get back here in the garage without riding the brakes very much. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If there was anything in this video that you thought was a little bit off or you want to debate me on some of the steps, absolutely feel free to throw a comment into the comment section. Happy to have a conversation with you. And if you found this video at all insightful to help you get your own job done, please do consider subscribing. Thanks so much. See you next time.